The first part of Lecture 7 concerns valence electrons. We are now to Chapter 3, which covers atomic structure and properties. Electrons fall in one of two categories. They are core electrons when they are tightly bound inner electrons. These are the ones in filled lower energy levels that are close to the nucleus, and they are unaffected by chemical reactions. Valence electrons do all the heavy lifting. These are the loosely bound outermost electrons. They are composed of the highest S electrons and electrons in partially filled levels. These electrons are involved in chemical bonding and reactions. So let's take boron as an example. Boron has five protons, and when it's neutral, it has five electrons. And I'm showing them here in their orbitals using the Schrodinger model. The core electrons in boron would be the 1s electrons. The valence electrons are the outermost s, so that would include 2s2, and any partially filled levels, so that would also include 2p1. So boron has three valence electrons. So going back to our periodic table, one of your vocabulary words in the past was main group elements. And now that you're familiar with the Schrodinger model, this involves the S and P blocks. So that would include columns 1 and 2 for period S, and the last six columns for period P. So here is your valence electrons definition. This includes the outermost S electrons and all electrons in partially filled sublevels. For main group elements, this would be the last row with period S and period P electrons. So let's look at the valence configurations for select main group elements. Sodium is in the first column and it has one valence electron, specifically the 3s1. Calcium is in the second column on the periodic table, and it has two valence electrons, specifically 4s2. If we move over to the s block on the periodic table, that is sometimes called period 3a. There are two ways the columns in the periodic table are labeled. You might go from 1 through 18, or sometimes there's an A designation for main group elements and a B designation for the other elements. So when I speak of the P block being 3A, I am speaking of this column right here. So in this 3A column, Aluminium is an example. Aluminium has three valence electrons, specifically 3s2, 3p1. Tin would be in the 4a column of the periodic table, and it has four valence electrons, specifically 5s2, 5p2. If I show you tin on the periodic table, you notice that its full electron configuration is krypton followed by 5s2, 4d10, 5p2. Notice we have left out the 4d10 electrons in the valence electron configuration because that sublevel is full. So if it's in column 4, like tin, it has 4 valence electrons. So I'm sure at this point you can guess the pattern. Something in column 5 like nitrogen, has five valence electrons. Something in column six, like selenium, has six valence electrons. And something in column seven, like iodine, has seven valence electrons. Noble gases do not typically bond to anything until you get to the heavier ones, so there's really no description of valence electrons for noble gases. They have none. And an example here is argon. So remember, the number of valence electrons is equal to the main group column number. 
What about transition metals? These are elements whose last electrons are added to the D block. The valence electron definition is the same. It is outermost S electrons and all electrons in partially filled sublevels. So for transition metals, this would mean whatever period we're in, S2, and then period minus 1 with the number of D electrons. So here are some examples. Let's look at nickel. The full electron configuration is argon 4s2 3d8. The valence electron configuration, we lose the argon and we just go with 4s2 3d8. How about niobium? Once again, we are using the outermost s and any partially filled sublevels. So that is 5s2 4d3. How about zinc? The full electron configuration is shown, and you notice that we drop the argon, and also the 3d10 electrons, because that sublevel is full for a valence electron configuration of 4s2. So here's a mix and match exercise of valence electron configuration compared to full electron configuration. We'll start with carbon. I am showing you the full electron configuration. Think to yourself, what would I like to drop? Well, the helium. So carbon's in column four, and its valence electron configuration is 2s2, 2p2. How about cadmium? We want outermost S and partially filled sublevels. So goodbye to the krypton core and also the 4d10 electrons. So cadmium's valence electron configuration is just 5s2. How about tungsten? Goodbye to the xenon core, but also the full F sublevel. So tungsten would have valence electron configuration 6s2, 5d4. How about europium? Here is the full electron configuration. And you notice the D is partially filled and the F is partially filled. So its valence electron configuration is 6s2, 5d1, 4f6. So here's a question for you, and I hope you're looking at your periodic table. Get it out if you don't have it. Please give the full and valence electron configurations for titanium. Here is another example for you. What are the full and valence electron configurations for selenium? This question asks, how many core and valence electrons are in a bismuth atom, which is neutral? Now certainly you can count these up, but remember that your electrons need to add up to the number of protons when we speak of a neutral atom. So there would be a sum of 83 electrons. So I believe it's easiest to find bismuth on the periodic table, find the number of valence electrons, and then take 83 minus the valence to give yourself the core electrons. What about those irregular elements in the 3D block? The definition is still the same. So if we look at chromium, the full electron configuration is argon, 4s1, 3d5. If we lose the argon core, chromium behaves as if it has six valence electrons in the configuration, 4s1, 3d5. Shown here is copper's full electron configuration. Now I know for zinc, the 3d10 was dropped because it is a filled sublevel. However, copper is rather unique. It has oxidation states of either plus one or plus two. So its valence electron configuration retains the 3d10. I am not planning to test you on irregular electron configurations or valence configurations, but I do want you to be aware of these things as you may encounter them in homework and in other science that you perform.
So valence electrons are important because they affect the behavior of different groups of elements. Your book has a statement, the periodicity of the chemical properties results from the periodicity in the valence electron configurations. Well, here's English. As one moves across a row of the periodic table, the chemical properties of each element change gradually. And these changes are the result of changes in the number of valence electrons. Let me give you an example, starting with sodium. Sodium's in column one, it has one valence electron, and it typically has a plus one charge. Magnesium is in column two, it has two valence electrons, and it typically has a plus two charge. Aluminium is in column three, it has three valence electrons, and it has a plus three charge. So that's an example of slowly changing properties as one goes across the period in a periodic table.